Yes. So chapter five, this is the chapter that we, we will focus our recap on, is about denoising. Uh, denoising uh, is a process that, um, well, that tries to uh, improve an image's um, quality. And so the first thing that we need to do uh, when uh, talking about the process is we, we need a model. And in our case, the model is, well, is a, is a model of noise. So um, what, is, what is noise? So there are a lot of different ways to define noise. And uh, the way we did it here for the lecture was in terms of an additive noise. So what does this mean? So I start out with an image F0. This is my original image. And um, additive means I add terms in terms of, uh, well, another function, eta, I add the noise to it. And this gives me my new image F. So. I think you all have seen a noisy image. Um, there are also different types of noise. There are also some stochastic components in here. Uh, but the important part is our image has been changed. The image quality has degraded. And we want to improve the image by the process of denoising. And by means of this process, we want to get a new image that is called U. So. This so far for the model, but this um, this does not help us uh, in order to to talk about how bad an image is or um, how good the the process worked. Therefore, we also need to in, introduce certain measures. So, how can we measure noise? How can we measure um, our um, the, the degree of of um, yeah improvement? Um, there we covered some. Uh, some different notions of, of error and of noise. And what you can see here is one thing they all have in common. So, um, and this is, this is an idea that we will also see in a later part of today's recap, is we reduce the information that we have to a single number. Yeah, because, um, well, humans have the problem that, uh, when they try to visualize things, it does only work for three dimensions. Higher dimensions we cannot visualize. Intuition can get lost. But the single number uh, can be visualized very good with, uh, well, because um, we know, given two numbers, which one is bigger. Yeah. So this means of comparison are available to us when we talk about numbers. And therefore, we introduce the norm. So we have seen a lot of norms, I think, in this course. and. It in some sort builds also the foundation for what we do because we need some some measure of uh, success, some measure of um, improvement, and um, so of course you have already calculated norms in your past with vectors, and so when you think about a norm, I want you to think about uh, of a, a generalized um, notion. Of length. Yeah, just like for a vector, the greater the norm of the vector, the bigger its length. Yeah. And if I plug in a difference of two points, um, then I the 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 norm of this difference is just uh, their distance. Yeah. So the length of the difference of f and f0 is just the distance. of f and f0. Yeah, so how far are they apart? So of course, so the first one, I think, um, is a very, uh, very obvious one. It just comes from our noise model. If I subtract uh, the original image from the noisy image, I just get the noise. Yeah, so I can measure how large is the noise. Um, then I have an, an error that I do, yeah, because um, normally I won't be recovering my original image by the process of denoising. Something will remain, and this is what we call the absolute error. Um, it's always a good thing to normalize the results in um, terms of uh, comparability. Yeah, If I want to measure how good my algorithm works, I can, of course, uh, measure it's the quality of my algorithm absolutely. 
But when I get a different image, yeah, maybe with the same noise, but a different image, then um, then these means of of absolute comparison they won't won't give me a good result. Therefore, we have also relative error measures that try to normalize out uh, this difference that I that I would experience there. So far for uh, the error measurements, and we already see here um, our next topic, which is well, this process of denoising. Now that we can measure our success and we have a model, how can we now implement this way of denoising an image? And the nice thing about this chapter, I have here the on the left-hand side still the table of contents. There are diff very different ways to denoise an image. Some of them are related, as we will be seeing, but some of them are also just, they, they come in with new ideas. So let me also open up. Ah, no, so we, we can still st uh, um, stay here. I will be opening the summary of what I wrote in just a second. So the first thing that we talked about were masks. Yeah, filter masks. So a mask, as we um, started out in 2D, yeah, so images in our setting normally were 2D. They look like a cross like this, and then the, uh, I put in some parameters, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and uh, epsilon here. And um, the idea of applying a mask is to smooth out errors by taking um, spatial means. Yeah. So if I have, uh, if if my uh, image contains noise, the idea here is to reduce the noise by um, summing up neighboring values and dividing them through um, well a certain number here. That's not always a mean value. Depending on the numbers alpha to epsilon I choose, I get um, something that is called a weighted mean. And the operation that I uh, just described you is uh, called convolution. And we write it in symbols. Uh, if u is our image, yeah, the noisy image, we take this asterisk and apply it to the mask that I think I want to be called m. Yeah, and the convolution, this is an operation uh, that you, on the one hand, have an intuition for. So we take neighboring values, we sum them up, we weigh them. Yeah, And so I won't be covering the formula here today. You can look it up in the lecture notes. And um, yeah, so the idea here is, I think I have a nice sketch here from the lecture notes. So we take, we have this this little peaks in our signal. So let us say this is this here is the noise. Then by taking a mean, we smooth out the image here. So so far for a discrete image. Um, how is the continuous way of looking at this? So we have also covered methods to go. From discrete to continuous image and back in the interpolation chapter. I think this was chapter um, chapter two. Yeah, it's also here on the left hand side. So we can also do the same idea in uh, for continuous images. So also the intuition stays the same. Uh, the formula will be different. So um, we can, we do not have a, a, a grid as a mask, but uh, so. We, we can take any function that we want. And normally, um, if we want to take a spatial mean value, what we could use as a mask um, or a convolution kernel, so to say, is a characteristic function, yeah? something like this. And then the convolution, well, it still has the same symbol. So we convolute our image with, uh, with a mask. So this is just a characteristic function of um, of a square with side length two that is centered in zero. And there we have a formula using an, an integral. Yeah, so in terms of symbols, 
um, what changes from discrete to continuous is we um, for masks we switch from this grid yeah a discrete grid with uh, in this example um, five values sometimes we also have a little bit of larger grids maybe with nine values we switch to a function that has a value at every at every point so infinitely many points can be put in here and at the convolution we switch from a sum to an integral yeah, but the so the way the, these formulas are built up um, remains the same so the convolution is for a smoothing effect So, and if you if you look at this drawing, I think it's very obvious what sm what smoothing means. So the the high the highness of the peaks is reduced, yeah. Well, not perfectly. Uh, we have some elevation in in other parts. Yeah, this is just due to the fact that we, um, yeah, that we take a mean value. So now comes the first change of perspective. Another operation. Uh, that we that we can use is multiplication or uh, a cutoff. Yeah, and in this setting um, we change to this setting via uh, an, another tool that we have been using quite extensively in this course. So it's a very important tool for us uh, with means of the Fourier transform. So as I, has, I have still the table of contents on the left-hand side, this is here uh, frequency domain filtering. So fre the frequency domain is opposed to the spatial domain, the domain that I go into when I, um, when I apply the Fourier transform. So and how do the objects look like here in the discrete setting? So normally we have uh, the Fourier transform of our image and we multiply it um, well you can still call it a mask yeah but it's it's now at the operation that we use is just regular um, uh, point wise multiplication um, well you can also think about it um, in terms of a matrix that I uh, that has the same size at our image and um, so we cut off some frequencies um, and others they remain in the image. So I try to visualize this here with a matrix that has a lot of zeros and in the center there are some ones. And the ones correspond to the frequencies that I want to maintain. The zeros correspond to the frequencies that I want to lose. So I also have here a sketch from the, from the lecture. So I need to enlarge it a little bit. So we start out with an image and then we change the domain. So we go from the spatial domain to the frequency domain. So it's also here. And in the frequency domain, the frequency information of our image is, um, well, it can be divided uh, into the low frequency part and the high frequency part. Uh, so it's not sure where to where to draw the distinction, but that's but at some point we will say these are the low frequencies, the other ones are the high frequencies. And now our model, so we are once again modeling um, error, but now in terms of frequencies, we say that the high frequencies they correspond to noise. So we are a cutoff. So and it's a really hard cutoff because it um, it multiplies with zero. This means if I multiply this part here with, with zeros and the other one with ones, well, the left part will, of course, be maintained and the right part, it will just be, um, well, flattened out completely via the multiplication with zero. When you implemented this in the exercises, well, there was no need to multiply things. You could just um, copy the values that you have here to a new vector and uh, well leave the other zero values unchanged so as we switch to a to the domain that is not not our image domain uh, so but, but it's a domain of, of values here um 
we need to go back from the frequency domain to the spatial domain. And for this, we use again the Fourier transform, uh, or better to say, the, uh, the inverse transform. Um, of course, this also it works the same way in the um, in the continuous setting. Yeah, so let, let's let's think of the the right column here as the continuous setting. Um, here I multiply with a yeah, with a cutoff function, for example. Yeah. So and what happens? When I go back with the inverse Fourier transform, um, we have also had some examples for this. So I need to make some, some space here. So, um, yeah, so we have now the, the, two, the two ways to, uh, to denoy something. And let's say uh, I start out with a convolution. With a, with a, a mask or a, a function here, and I take the Fourier transform, then there are certain rules. So there is a, this uh, theorem on multiplication that tells us um, the Fourier transform of a convolution is nothing else than the product of the Fourier transforms. Ah, and if I go back, so if I apply the inverse Fourier transform on both sides, what I get here is, well, I can calculate the convolution by applying the inverse Fourier transform to the Fourier transform multiplied with some m. Yeah, and this m is a, is a multiplier. So we can also design convolution operations by uh, making use of Fourier transform methods and saying, well, um, this m, this contains the frequency filter information, like for example, uh, this, this cutoff here, and then I just transform back. Those are some of the rules that we covered for the um, Fourier transform. There are a lot of other rules that we use throughout the course, um, especially when we uh, deal with norms. So this was a this was the first part of uh, of filters that we uh, that we saw in our course, and uh, the next thing that we did was um, we. We were considering um, a smoothing operation by solving uh, PDEs, partial differential equations. And um, how did this work? So um, I think the, f the best thing to start off is with the mask. So um, after some, some studying of general mask, we found out that one particular mask that works very well because it minimizes um, noise in, so, in some sense, uh, was this, this spatial mean filter with prefactor one one fifth. And um, so with the methods above, we can apply this filter. And then, um, of course, if you are not satisfied with the result, you can apply this filter more than once. And by comparing, the outcome of the filter operation with uh, your starting value at a, at a, a particular step, we could derive a difference equation uh, that looked like the following. So let me enlarge this also a little bit. So how does this uh, how does this work? So um, we start out with our um, uh, our uh, our image after n times of applying this um, this mask, yeah, and then we consider the difference to the to the new image that I get when I apply this mask once again. So this is what what happens here. So comparing, um, so note that that this part here is not the mask m that we saw before. Yeah, so it, in in the middle it carries. Uh, minus uh, four that comes from some calculations that I'm going to omit in this recap. Um, but we, what we get here is a difference equation. And uh, we can now interpret this, um, this difference equation um, once we, um, once we learn uh, something about differential operators and how to discretize them. 
Because when we take a closer look here on the left hand side, so this is nothing else than a discretized uh, time derivative. And what we see here on the right hand side, or at least this part, if we uh, forget about the prefactor for one minute, um, this here is a spatial derivative, discretized. It's a second derivative. And in fact, it's the Laplacian that we see here with a prefactor, one fifth. Um, so we can relate this equation to a partial differential equation uh, that is the famous uh, heat equation or diffusion equation. Yeah. So here we are again in a continuous setting. And on the left hand side, uh, of course, we are in the discrete setting. And so let me also, let us not forget about the scaling factor here. Yeah, but for the intuition, what we see on the left hand side is a discretized version of this heat equation. And of course, we also have some uh, correspondence to the fact that here I'm applying multiple times uh, this filter mask. Um, in the continuous setting, what I can do is I can just um, apply one mask with the correct scaling, which is our um, Gaussian kernel. So the Gaussian kernel um, just gives me, starting with an image at time zero, gives me the whole image at the time t when I scale it correctly. So this, uh, this was a lot of theory. And um, when you uh, started to implement these equations, uh, so in practice, uh, there are also some further things to consider here, uh, which are boundary conditions. So boundary conditions mean that, so normally we do not have an infinite image. Our image uh, has a domain omega that is bounded in some sense. And all these operations that we have here, and it does not depend if we are in the discrete or the continuous setting, they uh, need to know what is going on on the boundary. Yeah, Because when I, when I apply a filter mask, then um, for the boundary points, this filter mask will need to know what happens with the points that are located outside of the domain of omega. And two boundary conditions, um, I think we covered multiple times in the exercises, uh, are the Dirichlet boundary condition. Dirichlet boundary condition means we extend our image. Yeah, so we need, we need to get some information here. So we need to extend our image um, by zero. Yeah, this is the simplest way, and this is also the default way it happens when you apply a mask, a convolution mask in MATLAB, then um, yeah, the computer will uh, silently assume that uh, you are extending your image by zero. Yeah, and this, also, uh, this, of course, causes artifacts in, uh, in the final result, because, um, well, if I, if I have here, at this point, a very high value, and I take a mean value there, then um, then these zeros will, in some sense, flow into our image, causing uh, this value here to get um, to get reduced drastically. You sometimes see this if you up apply a filter mask multiple times to an image, and you have a zero extension, um, then these zeros will appear to be wandering in the image, and you will have a, a black a boundary that seems to approach the center within time. So there is another boundary condition that um, that that can prevent this, but it's uh, sometimes not not a suitable one. But it's well, it's an option to choose and to um, to keep in mind, uh, not only in image processing but for partial differential equations in general, uh, because they also come up, of course, in um, in mechanics or in electrodynamics. So uh, this is the Neumann boundary condition. Sometimes uh, you can also just say it's a, it's a symmetry boundary condition. Uh, and here we have also zero extension, but um, of the normal gradient or the normal derivative. Yeah. So this means um, 
So we, we extend our image constantly. So normally we only, uh, we only need to know uh, one row or one column of neighboring values. And this is a constant extension. A constant extension uh, in terms of values of the image, zero extension in terms of the derivative. Okay, so far for the first non-stationary PDE that we covered here, uh, why non-stationary is because the time derivative is not zero yet. Yeah? So this means um, it changes over time and this is also what we observe. Speaking of observation, I have also found a nice animation on Wikipedia. You may have seen it as well um, of this non-stationary behavior of solutions to the heat equation. So we start out here with a very sharp profile and then uh, we use this as an initial condition to our, uh, to our PDE. And then you see this smoothing effect of this equation. It's, it, it almost looks like something is melting away. Yeah. Um, so you see, if you, if you let it run a lot of time, there won't be anything left of this, of this shape. Yeah. But, um, if you look uh, at the first times, we have already, I think, a, a good smoothing effect. Uh, in fact, mathematically speaking, the smoothing effect in terms of uh, differentiability is already there uh, for, um, for, every t, uh, for every t that is uh, greater than zero. Yeah, but the details on this are, of course, in the lecture notes and in the exercises. So this, this was the first example of a diffusion equation. And what you can see here as well is um, smoothing does not make everything better. So it reduces noise that may be uh, inside the image. So in this example, we do not have any noise, but you can observe something else. Um, it's a smearing out of uh, sharp corners that we had and that we probably also want to maintain. And this is the second or the next part that we want to cover. Um, this is the Perona Malik approach uh, to um, to diffusion control. Um, oh, so this was a little bit too large. So why do we want to control diffusion? Well, we we want diffusion on the one hand because um, diffusion reduces noise, but we do not want this diffusion to work everywhere in our image. Um, because it also smears out edges. So how can we motivate this diffusion control approach? Um, so a good way to start is, um, is by writing down our Laplacian, so the differential operator on the right-hand side, in the divergence form. So we use the divergence of the gradient so, and it's also important uh, to have uh, in your head how these differential operators work. So the gradient is nothing else than the vector of first derivatives. So now the idea is uh, to introduce a diffusion matrix. And I call it a curly M, so we do not confuse it with the mask M above. So this is a curly M. And how do we do this? Um, so we just write it in front of this two-dimensional vector. So this here is a two by two real valued matrix. And then I get a new differential operator, generic one, by multiplying this matrix with my two element vector. Yeah, it's a two by two matrix. So, um, it has four entries, M11, M12, M21, M22. And I multiply this with the first derivative of U with respect to the one direction and the second direction as well. So sometimes uh, one does not use one and two, but X and Y. Um, yeah, this should not confuse you. And what we have here is a matrix vector product. 
Yeah, so one important um, point for me is don't confuse the diffusion matrix with um, the masks that we used before, the convolution masks. Those are two entirely different things. Yeah. So this I'm, I'm highlighting this because this this is uh, something that happens uh, too often in exams that uh, one thinks of this M because it's the same Latin letter as the same symbol. Um, so it's it's not possible to have a different symbol for every different object. Uh, sometimes um, one just uses uh, the same symbol, but in a different context. And if we are in the context of Perona Malik and uh, diffusion control, capital M means diffusion matrix. And the diffusion matrix is always two by two. So there are different choices. So, and I'm just going to copy my notes and then um, talk them through with you. So we can also cover um, the last method that I want to uh, show you today. So there are different choices for this two by two matrix M. So I'm always highlighting this again, that's the two by two matrix. And um, this shows us that, that this approach is a generalization of the one that we have for the standard heat or diffusion equation. Because when I choose M to be the two by two identity matrix, yeah, so if I plug in the identity here, I just get out the standard Laplace operator the standard heat equation. So we also saw that there can be some scaling in front of the Laplacian. Yeah, this was when we derived the heat equation from the multiple applications of the of our mask. Yeah, the mask was that we used here was this mean value mask. So if we apply this multiple times, then we get a scaling in front, and we can also model the scaling here by just introducing a prefactor c that is positive yeah so this uh, in terms of physics this is just a different conductivity yeah? if you are talking about um, heat yeah? then we our material just has another conductivity and then we model this with a different c the next thing that we can do is we can change this scaling um, to make it more adaptive to its surroundings. So these two approaches that we saw here, they uh, they do not know about uh, the position that they are applied to. They are uniform across the whole domain. Yeah? So they are constant. So M is constant. So the, the two next approaches and th those are the ones one really wants to talk about when one talks about Perona Malik are uh, that we allow our C to depend on the position that it's applied to. Which functions do we use for C? Um, normally we use uh, something that looks like this. So we have one by one plus the gradient squared divided by an, uh, another factor that controls um, how this is applied. And we had an exercise on it where you saw how the value of kappa decides which edges are smoothed out and which ones are steepened. I'm not going uh, into details here, but the idea of this function is that it's very large, or it's it's one, yeah? So it, we, we, we are in this setting here um, when the gradient is very large. So for large gradients, so let me maybe do this. So for large gradients, we are in the standard heat equation setting. And for very small gradients, yeah, um, ah, no, so, sorry, I got a little bit confused. So for very large gradients, this means uh, the denominator here is very large and dividing one by something that is very large, I am essentially at zero. Yeah, so I can, I am in uh, in this setting here with a scaled Laplacian and the C is very small. Yeah, this means I control the, con uh, the diffusion in a way that there is no diffusion. 
if I have a very small gradient, yeah, so this gradient is almost zero, then I'm uh, in this case here, standard heat equation. This is how I control what happens in different um, parts of my uh, of my image. Yeah, I can control the regions where I have high diffusion and the ones where I have small diffusion. And I can do this also uh, in a way that I can not only control control the intensity of the diffusion, but I can furthermore control the direction in which the diffusion works. The best example, I think, is uh, when we have an image with an edge that is parallel to, to one of the axes, then I do not want to have no diffusion in this direction because this will smear out the edge, but I want to have diffusion in a perpendicular direction. Uh, uh, direction. And this is um, what one can realize with different functions for different um, directions. And um, we can model this also with a diffusion matrix M by modifying the diag diagonal um, entries here. So the details are in the lecture notes. So the last approach, that is a very general approach. And um, so I see we, we do not have so much time, but it's a very important approach. Therefore, I, um, I hope that I can cover everything that I, that I prepared for you is um, variational or energy methods. They are a little bit more abstract, um, but I, I hope I have, uh, I have brought with me a little bit of um, well, real life example or a simple example to think about how these variational methods work. First of all, um, variational methods, they, you find them throughout uh, all chapters of our uh, script. Therefore, it's important to understand how they work in general and then see how they are applied in the special cases that we use them. We always have two steps in variational methods. The first is we need to formulate the wishes that, uh, that, we, that we have on our uh, algorithm. So, in the denoising chapter, our wish is um, well, we want to denoise the image. Um, but on the other hand, we do not want to lose all the information on our um, initial image. So and this is in terms of wishes. And the next part is the math more mathematical part. We need to find an interpretation of these wishes in terms of a functional. And this is, I think, where the problem with very abstract object comes into play. Recall when we started today, um, I introduced the norm as an as a tool to, um, for example, compare uh, two elements of a vector space by means of their distance. Yeah, and the norm was something like that gave me a number that told me how long something was or how large the difference was. So this something that I plug into this functional is a very abstract object. It comes from a convex set or it comes from a vector space. Um, it is nothing that we can really grasp. And the power of the functional is that it reduces this very um, cumbersome object to a number, something that is very handy and that we can compare. So we can now, we now have a means of saying something is large or something is small. and um, I haven't brought an example from my childhood with me that is not related to functional analysis, but that works the same way. So those are some cards with uh, cars on it. And every car has some specifics, uh, like the number of cylinders, like the top speed. And when, when one compares two cars, one cannot say, well, the one car is better than the other one. Normally, this won't work because the cars are very different. But once we choose one class, yeah, like the number of cylinders, then, of, then we have reduced the car, so this um, cumbersome object, to a number. And this number is something that we can compare. So for example, if I choose two cars, yeah, and I don't want to know which one is better than the other, I can't do it. But if I say, well, which one has more cylinders, then I can. Yeah, because then I'm comparing numbers. And for the numbers, we have this relation that we know since primary school, the larger on the smaller relation. 
So back to image processing, um, which are the functionals that we use for smoothing out um, images. So in the smoothing uh, department, we use functionals J that um, have, well, they use the norms again, and they measure first of all the distance of uh, the image that we want to produce and our original image with, uh, with terms of a norm. And then we also have a penalty term that contains the gradient. And we choose U coming from this cumbersome space, the Sobolev space. It's a technical space that we need to in order to formulate this functional here. Different way to do this if one does not want to penalize the uh, gradients that much is one can change the norm from a two norm to a one norm and one gets um, this uh, rudin osher uh, Fatemi functional. So I think um, we are out of time for today. I will upload the notes with some more functionals here uh, I had prepared for the other sections but this, this was everything I wanted to cover from the denoising chapter. I hope uh, you found this useful. Thank you.